Lynn, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you here today. I've been wanting to talk to you forever. I love listening to you. Uh, but for uh, the podcast listeners out there, where do we find you today? I'm over in New Jersey, uh, and uh, I've been following your work for a while too. Actually, I think I've I've been I cited some of your stuff as far back as probably like five years ago in some of my articles. I know you put out some good data, so I'm always a fan of that kind of thing. The really interesting stuff goes back even farther. You have to find it in the archives. I've I've tried to d- delete most of the stuff where I look bad, but the uh, the insightful stuff that's held up over time, survivorship bias, is actually pretty hard to. Uh, avoid that in this day and age. Um, all right. So there's a lot that I want to talk about today. Again, I mentioned I love listening to you. So I figure we'll just do some jumping off points. You're uh, a fellow. We actually have a lot in common. You were, wait, wait before we get started, you're a former aerospace gal. Is that right? Or aviation? Where, where you were an engineer? Yeah. So my background is electrical engineering, but it was in the aviation industry for the most part for about a decade. So that, that's that's kind of my kind of started out doing design work and then shifted more towards management and and finance of the engineering facility. Yeah, electrical, that's the hard one. My uh, I come from a family of engineers and we come from an aerospace background. So that's definitely had a soft spot in my heart. Uh, listeners know this, but I joke that I was an aerospace engineer for about one semester, maybe two. And I sat in on uh, statics and dynamics. And I was like, this has nothing to do with being an astronaut. This is, seems really hard, a lot of math. But we, uh, one of the courses, the history of aerospace was taught by a former astronaut, which was pretty awesome. So still a soft spot in my heart. We did a whole series on uh, startup investing, angel investing in the space uh, sector. We need to do a few more of those. How did you kind of start to make the shift to this investment world? Um, there's a lot of people I talk to that, uh, ping me a lot, actually, that are always curious. They're like, oh, you know, hey, I'm doing X, Y, Z, thinking about shifting to kind of, uh, you know, what's going on in your world. Was it a curiosity first or hobby for you? Kind of where, where'd that bug start? Yeah, what you just said, basically, it was always a curiosity. And for me, actually, investing preceded engineering. So I was, I was you know, investing since I was uh, in high school. It's when I was buying my first uh, equities. Well, what were they, by the way, to interrupt you? Do you remember? The first one was Adobe. Oh, wow. Yeah. And actually, it's done really, really well, but I made money on it, sold it. So classic, you know, instead of just letting it do its thing, I eventually sold it for a profit and then got in years later at a higher price. Uh, kind of classic. So yeah, I was, I was kind of in, into value investing. Like I, I was reading Buffett, things like that back when I was in high school. But when it came time to go to university, I, you know, my other big interest was math, science, engineering. And so that, that's what I wanted to pursue professionally. But like that interest never went away. So I, I started, you know, I kept writing about it and learning about it along the way. And it was like in 2016 where I decided to, to you know, start shifting towards that direction. And so it started out as kind of a hobby and then eventually it became like a full-time thing. So for me, it's just always been an interest in both. And, and sometimes you make a career out of one and then make a career out of the other. And so do you still keep a toe in uh, the aviation world or is it a full-time macro all the time for you? For me, it's full-time macro, um, but I, I try to use the aspects of, of technical background that I have. I think one thing I do compared to um, a lot of analysts is I, a lot of my focus is on real world stuff. I think a lot of times finance can get kind of lost in the weeds and, and disconnected from the real world. Whereas I, I, I think my engineering background, I think I know how hard everything is. And like you just pointed out, I mean, engineering is like super hard and the real world is always harder than just like the pieces of paper we trade around representing the real world. And I think if you've realized that and you kind of go down the rabbit hole of like, you know, energy or, or some of these other areas that can be very problematic, I think having some sort of engineering background can be helpful. Yeah, you brought back a fond memory when uh, my father passed years ago, but we were kind of going through his stuff and found an old postcard for listeners. Postcard is like uh, an email. You get an actual physical piece of paper in the mail. Um, but I had written to my father, but we used to talk about investing and, and that sort of thing. But um, it had talked about investing in, I think, Disney and Coca-Cola and maybe one more. And I, I think if I would just taken my own advice, bought those stocks, and just never been involved in finance ever again, I think I probably would have generated more alpha and be a lot wealthier and just held them (laughs) for for four decades or whatever it is. But uh, okay, so in this short time that you've kind of made this switch, you know, you have a 
uh, sort of a command of history that, uh, you know, is uh, pretty rare in our world. And I'm surprised that, so what's local to you? Princeton, Harvard, Bridgewater hasn't scooped you up at this point, um, which is a blessing they haven't because uh, we, we get to read what you're writing. But there's, I figured a good jumping off part besides just asking you what's going on in the world was a piece you've written recently and I believe it was a couple months ago, uh, maybe in June, but you were talking about kind of the way the world looks today it reminds you a little bit of an analog of, of some prior times, but it's not the one the media traditionally talks about being the 1970s as much. You want to kind of walk us through that piece, uh, taking us back um, the 1940s and kind of the way the world looks today? Yeah, that theme has been something I've been emphasizing for actually a couple of years now, and it, it keeps being unfortunately more true, right? So it, it's almost like the, the further we go into this decade, the more it ends up looking like the 40s. But that was originally sp- inspired by Ray Dalio's research. The idea of the long-term debt cycle is something I came across many years ago. And it answered a lot of the questions I had, which is, you know, if you just keep building up debt in the system, what happens eventually? Uh, what is what is kind of the, you know, can't nothing, trees can't grow to the sky, so if you get to hundreds and hundreds of percent of debt to GDP, public and private, what eventually happens? Where does that go? And so Ray Dalio's long-term debt cycle kind of answered that question, in my view. And I then wanted to, you know, validate it, recreate it. And so I went and looked up kind of the raw data. It actually kind of started like he had these great charts. And then like six months later, a year later, I want to reference the chart again, but I wish it was like updated. And so I was like, well, I could just I could just make a chart like this. And while I'm at it, I can make 15 charts pointing at kind of different directions of this or, or examining from other avenues. So I went out, got the raw data uh, as best I could from a bunch of different sources. It's actually kind of tricky when you go back far enough to find really good data. And it's always kind of a challenging thing, especially if you want to, like I said, look at it from so many different angles. Uh, you know, you can find some data, but then you're like, well, I want this data too. I reconstructed a lot of that to... Just look at what you know. What happened last time, say, developed market economies had this much debt to GDP, uh, and why did it happen like that? And what are the kind of the bottlenecks that that kind of force things to turn out the way they are? And what I essentially found was that, in many ways, the 2010s, really the aftermath of the of the global financial crisis, looked a lot like the 1930s, which was the aftermath of the 1929 crash. Basically, what those had in common was that they were popping of major private debt bubbles, and in the aftermath of that, you have some degree of deleveraging, you have interest rates go to zero, and you have just kind of growing discontent, uh, populism, basically not not the most pleasant of times. Obviously, the 2010s were a lot better than the 1930s. We had better technology and no dust bowl and finance was a little bit smoother, but there was a period of stagnation. I've seen some analysts call it a silent depression in some ways, basically, in both in emerging markets, especially in emerging markets, you know, you have 15 years of like the emerging market index going nowhere. If you look at developed markets, it, it felt better, but at the same time, we just had you know below trend growth, and like I said, rising kind of economic discontent, and that kind of thing eventually leads to it, the system so fragile that when it, when it runs into an external shock or creates its own external shock, you start to get massive fiscal expenditures. Uh, and that's what we saw in the 40s with the war. And that's what we saw in the 20s uh, here with, with COVID and the reaction to COVID. Because basically, you know, if we had a less indebted, more resilient system and would hit with something like that, the, the response could be smaller. But if you have that indebted of a system, when you get hit with something like that, that disrupts cash flows and operation, you kind of necessitate these really crazy responses. And so generally speaking, what makes a long-term debt cycle different than a short-term debt cycle is that really the only way out is kind of this period of, of financial pressure and currency devaluation. And so you get a period of high inflation, but low interest rates. And so that's what the 40s and the 20s of so far had in common. And it was very different than the 70s because the 70s, you had high inflation, but low debt and therefore pretty high interest rates. They could try to combat that. Whereas in the system we're in now, it's high inflation and low rates. And you know the 70s are still instructive because for example, what makes the 70s interesting is that the U.S. oil production peaked in 1970. You know, after like 100 years of like going steadily upward, it structurally peaked for decades until all the way to the you know the shale revolution. And so you had a supply shock in addition to some of the you know the increasing demand you saw. And so I think that there's still things we can learn from the 70s, 
But as a whole, I, I generally find the 40s more instructive. And you know, the, we hear a lot the past couple of years of how unprecedented something is, it's totally unprecedented. And in some ways that's true, but I do feel like if you look at the 40s or look at the idea of the long-term debt cycle and prior kind of periods that are somewhat like this, you at least have a framework. You at least have kind of a, a vague you know, direction, uh, understanding of kind of what kind of things we're likely headed towards. And then you can start focusing on the nuances of how are we different from them? Because of course, if you look back long enough like that, you, there are tremendous differences as well. So I'll, I'll stop there, but essentially that is been a huge thesis of mine that that in many ways we're in this kind of fiscal dominance, more inflationary, kind of like it's kind of wartime finance, even without the war. And then of course, now recently you actually now have some degree of actual war as well. Yeah. I love the analog um, instructive sort of analogies in history because there's there's times like you mentioned, they're never exactly perfect, but they rhyme and sometimes it's a little different for XYZ reason, but but at least it gives you some framework or anchor from which to think about the world you know so so often you hear in the media and commentators say things like never seen this before and then you're like well you know or and usually it comes when some sort of expectation has been shattered where you know someone thinks xyz couldn't happen and then all of a sudden it does and so um maybe talk a little bit more about this concept of financial repression which for listeners is you know interest rates being below inflation and what sort of effects that have? Yes, yeah, so I think you know to describe the long-term debt cycle, we can start with the short-term business cycle, the normal credit cycle, which is basically you have an economic expansion, you get rising debt to GDP, and then either the Fed kills it or it runs its course or some external shock happens. Something eventually causes some sort of rollover uh, period of, of economic uh, contraction, you get deleveraging of some of the malinvestment uh, or over, you know, kind of over, uh, entities that got over their skis. And the issue is that because of how the system constructed, you know, policymakers come in and try to short circuit that process and make it smoother and shorter uh, than it otherwise might be. And so they cut interest rates. They basically try to re-emphasize uh, credit growth during that credit contraction. And as a result, when you string a bunch of these together, instead of having like a sine wave of debt to GDP, you get like an upward sine wave where you keep getting higher debt relative to GDP. So higher highs and higher lows and interest rates keep, are going in the opposite direction. You keep getting lower lows and lower highs. Each cycle, you're squeezing more juice out of the orange for how much credit growth you can get. And eventually you run into the zero bound or in some cases mildly negative. And then it becomes you know pretty challenging because instead of higher debts being offset by lower interest rates, so lower servicing costs on the debt, now there's not really that lever anymore. And so that's you know both times in history when you ran into the zero bound for the first time after like, you know, either forever or decades. You know, it was 1929 and it was like 2008, right? So these these were major events in, in financial history because you got to the end of kind of, you know, this long period of credit growth. And so what makes those the ensuing process different is that they they there's so much debt in the system that they can't really deleverage nominally because like there's just so many claims for dollars compared to how many dollars there are that it's just like a game of musical chairs with like 20 kids but then like five chairs it just it's a disaster when it happens because they've they've already they built it up to such kind of artificial heights and so generally what you get instead is is you'll get some deleveraging but then you'll also get currency devaluation where if if the numerator is super high one thing they can do is tweak the denominator, basically create more money units, add more chairs to that game of musical chairs. So if 20 kids try to sit down on five chairs, you can be like, well, let's put, you know, another 10 chairs there. So only five kids don't sit down, right? And so that, that's essentially what they do. They end up creating a lot of money. And then the problem is you get a lot of inflation. And, you know, so if you go back to the 40s, for example, when they were fighting the war, you know, they got over 100% debt to GDP. And you essentially had you gave up independence for the central bank. They said, look, you can't just jack interest rates up to positive real levels. We need you to finance U.S. debt to win this war. And so you had large fiscal expenditures, large inflation that followed it. And then the central bank was holding rates near zero and even capping the long end of the treasury curve for years to finance all that government debt at negative real rates, deeply negative real rates, which is basically a type of kind of gradual default. And you know, there's a study by uh, Hirschman Capital, I believe it was, that showed that, you know, over the past 200 years, 
98% of, of countries, if they get their sovereign debt to 130% of the GDP, over the next 15 years, you're going to default one way or another. If those debts are denominated a currency you can't print, like if you're an emerging market that owes dollars, or if you are if you owed it in gold, you know, if you go back long enough in history, you end up just kind of defaulting or restructuring in some way. Um, and if it's dominated in your own currency, uh, instead you generally get that financial oppression environment where, of, of course, you know they get paid back every dollar or euro or whatever that they're owed, but those are generally worth a lot less. By the end of that period, they'll buy you less energy, less house. Uh, less stocks, less gold, uh, however you want to phrase it. And so that's, I think, what we find ourselves in now that's very similar to that period in the 40s. And it really applies for pretty much the entire developed world. It's not just the United States. It's also Europe. It's Japan. It's a number of other countries where we all kind of collectively have so much debt in the system that there's no way to, you know, both public and private debts, just kind of as this long period of credit growth that you know, now they can't really get rates below zero anymore. And now there's inflation. And now we have kind of real world supply constraints, uh, large fiscal expenditures, big increase in the money supply. And so you get this period where, you know, the Fed is raising rates, but they're raising them, you know, even though they're raising them kind of quickly now, they're raising them from such a low, a below point compared to inflation. And they're already getting signals of like yield curve inversion. And then, you know, uh, kind of signs in the market that they might not go as far as they, as they claim they will during a period of 9% inflation. And I think that's what we get when there's this much debt in the system. Yeah, um, I think we're actually chatting on a, on, on a Fed day here, um, the end of July. Uh, listeners, if you want to play around, if you're a super uh, data geek like I am with some of the historical numbers, there's a lot of free resources. We'll put a, a link in the post on some data resources, but one in particular certainly is uh, Schiller's, if you go to a professor's website, um, he has a Cape Excel sheet, but it also has interest rates, inflation, all sorts of other stuff. You can look back um, all the way back to the 1800s. But the example that Lynn's talking about in the 1940s is interesting because the, the long kind of interest rate or interest rates were capped around it's somewhere in the twos, two and a half percent as inflation many times went well above into the teens. 70s, similar, you had inflation uh, spark into the teens, but interest rates were much higher. Uh, in both cases, you wrote another piece talking about chess and checkmate and talking about kind of what some of the options for these governments are around the world. Do you want to kind of walk us through some of the thinking there? Is it necessarily a bad thing to, to kind of deflate this way where we just say, you know what, we got to suck it up? Inflation is going to be high, but um, this is this is how we get things back to normal. Or like, what are the choices for some of these countries around the world? And do they have a limited a limited uh, opportunity set of what to do? So generally, when a central bank uh, runs into a problem where where debt is that high, especially government debt, but really the whole you know the public and private sector combined super high debt levels, you know, in the aftermath of a private debt bubble. It's usually not an inflationary problem because you just got a reduction in demand. So you have overcapacity for a lot of things. But after you spend like a decade working through that and not really investing in commodities and not investing in new facilities, eventually you, you kind of find yourself more supply constrained. And so when you have high debt levels and then you run into like a commodity bull market, right? So you've underinvested in energy, you've underinvested in transportation, refining capacity, underinvested in certain mines, many of which take years to bring online. Uh, and you start to get that inflation from that, but you also have super high debt levels. That ends up being kind of checkmate for a central bank where they have high inflation, but they still can't raise rates to the positive real levels. And so historically, one of the options that they can turn to is yield curve control, where they say, look, we're going to hold short-term rates you know, at like zero, and we're even going to keep buying government bonds with printed money to suppress their rates as well, based on unlimited bid for you know, government bonds above a certain yield, meaning below a certain price to maintain that. And so, for example, the United States did that in the 1940s. And right now we have Japan doing that. So, you know, uh, short end rates are super low. And then even their long duration rates, they're pegging them at, you know, 0.25% for the 10 year, while their official inflation target is 2%. They pretty much have a, you know, implicit stated goal for negative real rates uh, kind of across their duration spectrum. And that's kind of a reality when you have 250% debt to GDP and then plus all the private debt in the market. We also see Europe 
encountering similar problems where you know you have Italy with 150 percent debt to GDP can't print their own currency and so they're relying on the ECB to maintain their bond yields uh, you know at, at reasonable levels uh, so you don't get sort of a fiscal spiral so the question is what happens when you get high inflation but still people don't want Italian bonds and you end up having QE into an inflationary spike basically suppress yields you know below the inflation rate make them comparable to owning US Treasuries whereas if you ask you know 99 out of 100 investors would say they'd rather own US debt than Italian debt given similar yields maybe even 100 out of 100 and yet you know you kind of have to just manipulate things and so generally what you get in that environment is financial oppression meaning that if you're a saver or you're a bondholder you kind of get screwed over and if you're a real asset owner uh, and if you have say debts that are you know manageable like a long term mortgage or something like that you're generally a beneficiary and so there are multiple winners and losers in that type of environment but it's at least something to be aware of because almost nobody with a printing press will ever you know fail due to lack of money right so it's it's kind of like follow the money follow the incentives for how it's going to go and yeah historically when you get super high debt levels it's like you know, those become unpayable. And then the question just becomes, are they going to be unpaid in, in nominal terms? Like we have, yeah, like what happens in emerging markets sometimes, or are they going to just be not fully payable in real terms? And in developed markets, that's, that's generally what you get. And that's kind of checkmate for central bank policy until such time as you've inflated enough debt away, or you've had some sort of reset that allows like another cycle to, to begin from there. Yeah, you know, I, I think the challenge for many investors is this sort of distinction between trying to think in nominal and real terms. And, and that's kind of hard. I think it makes a lot of people's brain hurt. Most people, I think, just think in nominal terms across the board. But obviously, listeners, if you have a 10% stock returns for a decade per year, you know, if you have 2% inflation, that's a lot different than if you have 8% inflation, right? That's the difference between 2 and 8% real returns you can eat. So let's kind of think about investors, you know, clearly in a financial repression, real negative real rate world. And we're seeing this in 2022. A lot of people are, are waking up to this. Bonds may not be the best place to be. Um, I think in the 40s and 70s, both uh, was was a tough environment. So, so uh, do we just hang out in stocks? Is that the choice? Like what, what are, what's, uh, what should we be thinking about um, if those analogs are uh, kind of, um, you know, a useful guide to where we are today? So in many inflationary environments, uh, and especially in financial oppression environments, generally real assets, harder assets are the place to be. Uh, and so you'll, you'll, Historically, you'll generally get weaker performance in paper assets, uh, as well as, say, highly valued growth assets. And you'll generally get better performance out of value type of assets, uh, yield generating assets, uh, and, you know, hard assets, especially if they're, you know, kind of long term leveraged, right? So if there's, you know, houses with 30 year mortgages attached, or there's high quality companies with pricing power that have like, you know, 20 year, year old bonds. Uh, that they borrowed, those different types of arbitrage, those are generally the types to be. And so if you look at the 40s, for example, you know, gold was uh, pegged and illegal. So that wasn't really a good data set for American investors, but commodities did well, uh, real estate did very well. Equities were kind of mixed because, you know, you had World War II going on, so a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but overall, that was a, a good time for investors to get in. It just, you know, it took some time for that to be realized, where something like real estate was more sudden uh, in such an inflationary and financially oppressed type of environment. And I, you know, my expectation generally is to see a similar theme here in the, in the 2020s, which is, you know, I think a lot of companies are reasonably valued compared to what you can get out of, you know, savings and bonds. If you're willing to look through, you know, what can be pretty extreme volatility and if you diversify. Um, so I generally like the, the more, value or dividend type of companies in this environment um, to the extent that I would go in growth I'd be very selective with what I'm looking at something that you know is you know maybe already got killed maybe you know because we've seen a lot of carnage and growth I think there's probably some babies thrown out with the bathwater there but yeah and generally speaking you want to be more commodity focused value focused and I, I think the biggest challenge right now is what to do with global investing uh, that that's always a big challenge um, just because there's so much kind of political, 
uh, geopolitical turmoil around there. I think probably eventually this decade we'll get a turn where you start to see more international uh, equity outperformance. But that is admitted something I've been early on. That's been something I've kind of been expecting. We got a number of false starts on that. Uh, so that's something I'm still kind of monitoring to see uh, to what extent that might that might unfold. Yeah, the, the foreign is sort of like waiting on Godot or emerging markets. I just happily continue to dollar cost average in. And, you know, for the younger crowd, you know, again, kind of going back to the old uh, deleveraging and government policy, there's always winners and losers. You know, the younger crowd, remember, you're kind of cheering. It's hard it's, and it's uncomfortable, you're, but you're cheering for markets to get really cheap uh, if you want to invest in them. And the older crowd, you're certainly not because you don't have as much runway unless you're investing for future generations. But I mean, some of these emerging market indices are, are darn near yielding uh, six, seven, eight percent on some of the some of these uh, funds and offerings. You know, one of the things that, again, going back to, you know, digging around in history was, you know, if you look at these environments, and this has been my least popular discussion topic at the beginning of the year and last year, it's, it's a little more less caustic now, but, uh, you know, was talking about just broad market valuations and the opportunity set. And if you look at the 70s, and if you look at the 1940s, in both decades, you had an opportunity to buy stocks at single digit PE ratios and talking about the 10 year PE. I mean, just think about that, my God. Um, you know, and, and despite us being down, whatever we are, 15-ish percent this year, you know, the, or 20%, and, and some things are much, much worse, the growth names, uh, but this sort of long-term PE ratio is really down to around 30-ish. And this was actually an energy analogy made. So you can use this to pivot to energy if you want, but I think it's useful for thinking about it too with inflation is... I'm trying to remember how you phrased it. It's time under the curve. So you, you can talk about this with energy, but I think the same applies to inflation too. Like if we just spike up to 9% inflation and come back down, that's one thing. You know, if we spike up and then hang around 6% for a decade, that's different than uh, spiking up to nine and back down to three. One of the things that you've mentioned was that the 40s and 70s value stocks certainly had a, a big run uh, and we've talked about that ad nauseum too, but um, feel free to take this sort of topic any way you want. Under the curve, you could take it energy, you could talk about value, you could talk about inflation, your pick. One of my themes kind of this decade is that I think inflation on average is here to stay for quite a while, but I've also been reiterating that it's not going to be a straight line, most likely. I mean, the 40s and 70s, you didn't have inflation in a straight line. You had disinflationary periods within uh, inflationary decades. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the same thing here in the in the you know the 2020s. Uh, you can get an inflationary spike, and then you can kind of come back down if you start to suppress demand or you fix some of the supply side issues. But until you actually resolve uh, more completely the underlying problem, I think that it's it's like holding a beach ball underwater. As soon as you let it go, it's it's bound to want to come back up. That's kind of the you know back in the in the prior decade, it's like markets had a tendency to want to disinflate. Just because you had overcapacity, oversupply for oil, things like that. And I think we're in the opposite environment now where the tendency is to want to inflate because we have underinvested in a lot of uh, real assets. And so even though we might suppress that for periods of time, I think the the longer term trend is still, you know, probably higher commodity and higher, higher um, inflation on average than we had the past decade. And so uh, I had that article about the area under the curve. It was actually a friend of mine in market that, that made that quote. So I decided to turn that into a piece. Um, and essentially, it's the idea that, you know, everyone's looking at the, oil, the price of oil, for example, and they're saying, is it going to go to 150? Is it going to fall down to, you know, is it going to go back down? And my, my point was that if you're a long-term investor, it's not really about what oil does in the next few months, whether it's 150 or not, or goes back down to like 80 uh, is irrelevant. And instead, it's about um, uh, you know what is the average price going to be? I think over the next five to ten years. And so my general theme is that even at current levels, even when oil is at you know 90, 100, 120, or if it goes up from there, that is just an ongoing cost for households and for businesses. And eventually, you get more and more realignment towards those things. And so, for example, energy pipelines, oil producers, companies like that, 
even at current price levels and current volume levels with current valuations, they're actually pretty attractive if you look at them out kind of a longer term perspective. And so the challenge with investing in commodities is always that, you know, in the very long term, they're not great asset class compared to what else you get. They're not these like long term compounders. Disinflation happens more often than inflation. So there are more decades than not where commodities are not great investments. And then even in inflationary decades, you can have some pretty violent volatility among them, even as they outperform. And so I think that having commodities and value oriented things long term, this decade is probably going to be very helpful, as it already has been. But I think investors have to be prepared for those huge shocks that can come along the way. Uh, those, those downward moves in what is otherwise like an inflationary structure. So kind of thinking about commodities, which is something that I feel like the, the better part of the investing landscape hasn't thought about in a decade, really at all, but is very front of mind now. I mean, the headlines every day out of Europe, natural gas, everything. It's like, and, and obviously the moves and everything, ag, base metals, energy, precious, and you talk about energy and investing in energy uh, kind of ideas. Um, you think this is an opportunity too? Uh, you know, most investors are woefully underallocated to that entire real asset space. So, well, how do you think about it? Is it is it uh, interesting? Not so interesting? I think it's very interesting, and and I agree with your point that basically people are very invested in disinflationary assets, right? So. The 60-40 portfolio, as we know it, is a pretty, you know, it really benefits from disinflation. Generally, it's in the 60 stock side, you're more in growth stocks than value stocks, and growth stocks tend to want a disinflationary environment. And then you have the 40, which is in, you know, paper assets. It's in, you know, uh, again, things that benefit from disinflation. And so what really disrupts, and we've had, you know, 40 years of a downward trend in interest rates, a downward trend in inflation. And out of those four decades, I mean, three of them were, were just outright disinflationary, right? So, you know, the 80s, 90s, and the 2010s were all these kind of disinflationary decades. We did have one uh, inflationary decade of the 2000s, but we had so many globalization levers that we could kind of pull so that we didn't really get the brunt of that inflation uh, in the way that we did uh, in, in kind of prior commodity bull markets like that. And so I do think that, you know, in this period, investors are kind of, they have a lot of recency bias built around these kind of compounding things that benefit from disinflation. And I do think that it is good to have some inflationary slices in a portfolio to kind of offset some of those disinflationary assets. Uh, it doesn't mean someone has to be 100% in them, but I do think that you know, just like we saw this year, I mean, you know, stocks and bonds went down together while energy went up. And that was an example of where you know, it's almost like energy became the thing you want to own that offsets your other stuff instead of stocks and bonds offsetting each other. Uh, that, that tends to be a theme in uh, inflationary types of decades where stocks and bonds are more correlated than we might otherwise like. And instead, it, it's commodities and real assets that, that, that tend to be the diversifier. So if you have a period of inflation, you'll generally have your stocks and bonds probably not doing great while those commodities are doing quite well. And then if you get a disinflationary pullback within that decade, you could have a, a period where your commodities and real assets are doing pretty poorly and your stocks and bonds are bouncing back. And so I do think that in a diversified portfolio, having at least a slice towards those real assets or commodity assets or those types of inf inflationary assets, I think is super useful. And I think that that will probably end up being the difference between underperformance and outperformance this decade is whether or not a, a, a diversified portfolio has that slice in it or not. You know, I, I think one of the challenges for many investors, and this just isn't, isn't retail, this is institutional too, is they kind of put the real asset in a too hard pile, you know, and, they, and they're not sure where to actually allocate. Should they be doing futures, ETFs? Should they be doing companies should they be doing tips reits uh and i think a big head scratcher for many and particularly within the community is is why haven't gold and, and gold stocks done better you know in this environment it seems like a environment ripe for those assets uh any general thoughts on kind of how to think about putting putting money to work in any of those places 
it depends on the type of investor. There are some easy ETFs for people to go to. I know that there's one called Gunner, for example, G-U-N-R. It's like the Morningstar Upstream Natural Resources, I believe it's called. Uh, you basically will get a big slice of all the different producers from around the world. And it's kind of divided into like energy and then like, uh, you know, metals and then like agriculture. There's also like the, I believe iShares Global Energy ETF. Again, you, it, you know, you'll get like a more diversified, you know, multi-jurisdictional exposure to energy companies. I think those are maybe just starting points that someone could consider. And then it depends on what type of investor they are. I think that say long duration oil futures are pretty attractive. I think that basically playing the commodity directly can be quite useful. And I also think that the pipelines uh, for energy are pretty interesting uh, that you get a little bit, uh, you know, that whole industry was over leveraged years ago and it, it's been kind of bombed out twice now first in the oil price crash uh, years ago, and then during 2020. And I think the structure that's remaining is now pretty attractive for kind of a yield-based asset. And so I think that there are multiple ways to play it. Okay. Do you have any opinion? And maybe you don't. As far as precious gold, gold stocks, they haven't done that well. Is it an opportunity? Do you think they look interesting? Is it something that you say there's a reason this hasn't done that well? Obviously, the 40s are tough because of, uh, you know, not necessarily um, the freely trading goal world of, of the post 70s until now. Um, how should investors think about it? So I think that there's opportunity right now. I mean, if you go back a couple of years ago, we had a lot of monetary inflation that was happening. So the broad money supply went up quite a bit. We saw a pretty broad rise across the board in asset prices. I mean, so it was a very risk on environment. And, you know, with gold investors, it became why own gold when you could just own all these, you know, if, if, if yields are low and inflation's high and, you know, money's pouring out, why not own uh, stocks, for example? And then now we're in this kind of like, you know, contractionary period, uh, risk off period. Gold is held up better than the broad stock market, but it's really not done as much as I think people hoped. And I think that's in large part because, you know, there's a there's a pretty significant quorum of the investment community that thinks the Fed will hike deposit a real rate, that will get uh, inflation back under control. We have a very strong dollar at the moment. So gold is actually done pretty decent if you look at it and say yen or euro terms, especially in, in a lot of emerging market currencies, uh, but specifically in the dollar, which is uh, unusually strong right now. It's kind of been lackluster. I think one way to look at it is, you know, there's a there's a firm out in in Europe called Incrementum, and they actually had a product that was like gold and Bitcoin mixed together, so that investors could kind of benefit from that volatility harvesting, right? Because if you you know generally Bitcoin does better in these rising PMI environments, you know, rising economic acceleration, and gold generally does better in uh, falling economic uh, environments, and you have kind of almost like a fragmentation of what people want to use as like their hard money holding, right? So you have a lot of people that might've otherwise bought gold by Bitcoin, but then, you know, it's a very volatile asset. So in other times, some of them might go back to gold. And generally, I think that that's kind of the, the bucket I'm in where uh, I think if you look at a, a basket of gold and Bitcoin together, it's actually done pretty well, all things considered. Uh, and I think that that might be a reason why gold has underperformed, which is that there's there's so many other assets you can own in that kind of financial oppressed environment, that gold is just one out of many. And what what basically gold and Bitcoin have in common is that these are, you know, money that someone can self custody, for example, that's maybe outside of the traditional system. And so it becomes kind of a competition between those, you know, those types of assets. Yeah, I think the setup is getting more and more interesting. I mean, historically, gold does particularly well during negative real T-bill yields and also flat or negative yield curve. And both were kind of at and approaching. So be curious. Um, but but it's interesting kind of think about, we did a piece on during the pandemic about how to think about what's the safest portfolio, you know, for the past century, which is sort of a fun thought experiment because 99% of the people assume the answer is T-bills, right? Um, and if you think of, okay, what does safe mean? Does it mean volatility? Does it mean drawdown? And can you build something that's that's more robust on a real return basis? So not just nominal. T-bills obviously win the nominal because they don't have drawdowns. But that's a 
starting to bucket in and think about gold and then now this new world of crypto too as uh you know a pretty big portion of that collateral allocation is an interesting thought experiment um i'm not settled on it yet but uh but it's fun to think about i think one of the challenges with the t-bill uh historical thing is that there's some selection bias there right because you know, the United States was the the rising power over the past century, right? So, you know, we started, you know, we basically were an emerging market that became like the dominant developed market. Whereas if you if you run, you know, short-term government bonds in many other countries, you would have gone through an even worse period of inflation uh, as the, you know, the, the treasuries did, right? So along with the Swiss franc, having U.S. government bonds has been one of the safest types of bonds. Um, and it basically gets even worse when you look at a global sense that it's not necessarily as safe as many people think in real terms, to kind of echo your point there. That is kind of the big challenge in this environment, that, that there's there's no truly safe asset. I mean, you know, gold can be volatile, but it generally holds its purchasing power long term. Uh, Short term treasuries are less volatile, at least in nominal terms, but they can they have these decades where they can just do utterly terrible, especially when you look globally. And I think you know one catalyst I'm really looking forward to see how gold responds to is when the Fed gets to a point where, you know, due to how much debt's in the system and due to uh, economic weakness, when they eventually kind of you know potentially stop tightening, even though inflation's still kind of a persistent issue. And I think that when you kind of go into that next period like that, I think that's where gold probably has its its best shot to kind of renew its its uh, interest among investors. Yeah. Listeners, the fun thought experiment, we'll put this in the show note link. So it's called the stay rich portfolio, but basically the conclusion, and this wasn't really particularly optimized. It was just kind of a example was that if you paired the global market portfolio of global bonds, global stocks, and, and some real assets with T-bills, um, you end up with a much lower volatility, lower drawdown, but with higher return or yield, depending on how you frame it. But that's kind of common sense too. It's like, are you preparing for any market environment? Disinflation, inflation, recession, contraction, growth, all the things kind of put together. It's kind of like the, the you know, the dummies guide to asset allocation, uh, you know, the, the ultimate diversification. And it would be interesting to see where crypto plays that role going forward. So, you know, you, you put out a lot of content um, and um, you're gonna have to correct me if I'm wrong here, because I'm also reading a book a history book that's coming out soon called The Price of Time. Um, and I can't remember if you wrote this or uh, if the author wrote it. So let's find out. Were you giving the analogy that, you know, that in the 1940s, where we are today has some vibes with the UK in the 1940s? Was this a thought experiment you were talking about where, you know, they were kind of the coming into you know, this big power that's on the decline and it's similar to us kind of today? So when I was analyzing the whole, going back to the 2020s to 1940s analog, uh, one thing I like to think about is, okay, what's different though? So I, I make all these comparisons to how they're similar and I can be like, okay, what's different other than obvious te technology and, and things like that. And one of the differences that when you look at back in US history, in the 1940s, the United States was a rising power and we were a, a structural trade surplus type of nation. So, you know, basically you had, the UK was the the prior leading power, global reserve currency. Um, they were running kind of structural trade deficits, and they weren't really growing as fast anymore. And so, um, United States was was the up and comer, uh, whereas the UK was the con uh, incumbent. And the UK was also more impaired by the war for obvious reasons. And so, so some of the things were were more dramatic for them. Whereas I think a similar analogy today is that you know we've had. The rise of China in some ways, and I don't think it's just, you know I don't think it's like you know they're going to go and like replace anything anytime soon. But it's like the United States is in a position where much like the UK, you know, uh, in the run up to nineteen forties, the United States has this structural trade deficit issue, and we are the existing global reserve currency. And you know if you look at our we have like you know what like four percent of the population, but it's you know at one point we had like eighty percent of global reserves were invested in in dollar based assets, and so. One of my kind of observations or theses is that we might have hit a high watermark for kind of U.S. dominance as a percentage of global GDP. I mean, that's already been on a downtrend, really, uh, for decades. But if you go back to, say, Ray Dalio's work, when you look at kind of the rise and fall of very major empires or major, major global powers, 
uh, you don't have everything rise and fall together. Some things kind of operate on a lead and some things operate on a lag. And so, for example, education is is one of the leading ones where you generally have, you know, rising power starts to become very well educated compared to a, a lot of their rivals. Uh, whereas one of the lagging ones is reserve currency status, uh, where, you know, that, that kind of comes after it's already hit a major economic power. You start to then you have the, the currency catch up. And then even when that power starts to wane, that currency has so much network effects and in existing entrenchment that it takes a long time to kind of diffuse and kind of roll over in terms of its dominance on a global scale. Uh, and so that's, that's just one of the comparisons I made between the United States today and the UK back then. And, you know, UK obviously did quite well since the 1940s. It wasn't like a disaster for the UK, but you just kind of had that, that change in its role globally. And so I, you know, as I look forward, I, I see a more decentralized world and, you know, more bipolar or tripolar world, most likely rather than kind of the unipolar world that we've been rather accustomed to since, you know, the end of the, the global war. We haven't spent too much time on the dollar yet. Uh, the dollar has been romping and stomping everything in sight, which is good if you're a skier who wants to check off some international destinations like I am. It can be bad or awful or wonderful, depending on if you're a exporter, where you're located, what's going on. Do you think about currencies much and how should we think about uh, if so what's going on with uh with the dollar and, and foreign currencies too i analyze currencies quite a bit especially the dollar because it's such a big mover in terms of global macro right so if for example you look at all the emerging market huge runs you know those were during dollar weakening periods um they generally face quite a bit of pressure when the dollar is 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 high or if it's especially if it's sharply rising and that's because it's, you know, the, the dollar is the global funding currency. And so there's something like, you know, according to the Bank for International Settlements, there's something like 13 or 14 trillion dollars in U.S. denominated debt that is outside of the United States. And it's not even owed to the U.S. for the most part. It's like your, a European entity will lend dollars to a South American entity, for example, or China will loan dollars to a, an African entity, either governments or corporations. And so what happens is if, if the dollar gets strong, especially quickly, it's like your liabilities are getting harder, right? So so you have a, a company or a government and your your revenues are in your currency, or in some cases, many currencies, if you're kind of a multinational exporter, but a lot of your liabilities are specifically in dollars. And so if the dollar is going up versus everything else, it's like, you know, imagine if you, if you had a mortgage priced in gold and gold was like soaring relative to your your house value or relative to your income, you know, you're you're getting squeezed, and it especially hits, you know, uh, any country that is kind of unprepared for that. So if it has low reserves as a percentage of GDP, if it's very reliant on foreign investors, those types of of comp, uh, countries can run into a lot of issues. Whereas ones that have structural current account surpluses that have high reserves, they're they're more able to withstand that type of environment. And then it's challenging because. This comes back and hits the U.S. as well, because if the whole world slows down due to its dollar liabilities hardening, that impacts the U.S. in a couple of ways. One is that, you know, 40, something like 40 percent of S&P 500 revenues are international. So all of those get translated back into fewer dollars and might even have lower sales growth just due to sluggish growth in those regions. And number two, the foreign sector generally slows down its, its purchases of U.S. assets, because the way that this whole thing is structured is the United States runs these you know, pretty persistent trade deficits with the rest of the world. The United, the rest of the world takes those dollars and then buys. You know, they they recycle their their dollar surpluses into U.S. assets, into U.S. capital markets, and so they buy treasuries, they buy U.S. real estate, they buy especially U.S. stocks uh, in in recent decades. And when they start to get squeezed, you know, if they need dollars, one thing that a lot of those credit donations can do is sell or at least stop buying U.S. assets. And so for multiple reasons, this kind of ricochets back into counterintuitively hurting the United States as well. And so just kind of how we've structured the global financial system, especially over the past uh, you know, 50 years or so, kind of creates this environment where if the dollar is going up, almost nothing else is. And if the dollar is going down, quite, just about everything else uh, can generally do pretty well. And so kind of following some of the dollar dynamics, I think, is really important. One of the nice things about you, Lynn, is you, uh, I think, 
you know, or agnostic or open-minded, you know, I follow your writing, uh, you know, you guys have a um, paid research service too, and you talk about ideas and trades, and sometimes the ideas uh, can be pretty wide ranging, you know, I thought, give you the opportunity to profile any that are, are on your, uh, on your uh, interesting list today, including even uh, ARC, which I saw at one point, as well as some, uh, you know, other dividend and cryptocurrency allocations. What, uh, what looks interesting to you? So it's funny, I've been, uh, you know, I've, I've been more in the inflation camp, dollar bear camp, uh, and not a huge fan of the ARC and Tesla type of, of assets. Over the past month, I became a little bit more sympathetic towards certain treasuries and 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 arcs type of stocks, at, at least maybe with like a six to twelve month view, just because of how oversold they were, and and that we could be seeing a you know kind of a a, a local top in a number of um, treasury rates uh, that I think has put a lot of valuation pressure on some of those those growth oriented companies, and so I, I think those are kind of an interesting thing to watch in terms of to see if, if their momentum does continue upward or not. But I think, you know, the, the, for me, the longer term attractive areas for this decade are basically the energy sector, uh, the value sector in general. So a lot of good dividend payers. I do like certain emerging markets. I just am careful about position sizing, especially for each individual market, because as we saw with, say, Russia, for example, you can get zeroed out of positions, even if the underlying companies are, are still chugging along. And so I think having that kind of globally diversified value uh, emphasis is something I'm kind of pretty bullish on uh, for this decade. And generally, my, my favorite growth asset going forward is probably Bitcoin um, as like a slice in portfolio. I kind of um, maintain some degree of counter cyclical exposure to it. So if it's skyrocketing, uh, I might you know rebalance back into the rest of the assets. Uh, and if it just fell off a cliff, I might lean into it a little bit. And because I think that while I'm not super thrilled about the broader crypto space, I think that there's kind of this regulatory arbitrage that has happened uh, over the past decade. And I think that it's it's like imagine an environment where you could just sell penny stocks to the public, right? I think that's kind of the environment that that has grown up around that crypto space, uh, especially the the worst parts of it. But I do think that what Bitcoin offers is kind of this it's really innovative technology. And that I think that is pro- the network is probably going to continue to grow and strengthen. And so that's something I, I monitor both for its own sake as an investment and to constantly ask myself, you know, as this technology uh, gets adopted and matures, if it does, what other industries does that affect, either positively or negatively? So that, that's kind of my overall framework looking forward when I, when I think, what, what do I, if I'm standing in 2030 and I think, okay, what performed well this decade? Those are generally the types of assets I'm looking at. Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly to me, part of my personality is attracted. And, and I think the research is interesting there when you look at assets or industries or even styles that get down to that like 80% down, you know, or, or 60, 80, 90% down to me is I'm, I'm, I'm like a fly that just attracts me. But I think it's an interesting place to kind of to fish, but also, uh, you know, the thing about Bitcoin that that is becoming more interesting and sympathetic to me, too, is that you've seen a lot of the past year of, of wreckage in the crypto space. There's been a lot of fraud and, and just grifting and hucksters and everything else going on. And Bitcoin, to me, I think actually, you know, short term, it hurts, but long term benefits from that and that, you know, it's it ends up looking a lot shinier to me than, than everything else. So to the extent that world uh, grows and, and blossoms, I, I think it, it, it becomes kind of the S&P of, of that space. And I know you've mentioned it before, and we have too. I don't have a position, but I think the GBTC closed-in fund, which is trading at about a third discount right now, becomes more interesting if there ever is any more puke coming, if there's not, so be it. But uh, to me, closed-in funds have always been an ample place to to look for opportunities when they trade at big fat discounts, and particularly during crisis, because that's when the, the spreads can really blow out. You got to be a little more active and put, you know, have some limit orders in. But I, I know plenty of people over the past decade during 
some various kind of flashy or uh, panic crash type environments that have gotten filled way below the market in those sort of investments. So that 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 seems to be interesting to me too. Yeah, there's a lot of entities in the space that were using Bitcoin as collateral and then going out and like leverage long on like altcoins, right? So when that all blows up, a lot of those entities have to sell their Bitcoin and that's obviously been disastrous for the market. Uh, but if you're kind of a counter cyclical investor, if you have diversification, dry powder, it's kind of an interesting place to, like you said, it's a good place to fish. And the general story with Bitcoin over its past 13 years of existence is it generally goes up in rising PMI environments. So economic accelerating environments, it generally does pretty poorly in uh, economic decelerating environments, lower liquidity environments, but the general trend is much higher highs and higher lows. Whereas if you look at most other crypto assets, they had, uh, the majority of them have trouble kind of gaining any sort of like structural multi-cycle momentum. They usually are these kind of like flash in the pans. They, they're, you know, they're popular for a cycle or two and then we're on to the next thing. Whereas Bitcoin's kind of been the constant uh, in that space. And I think that there's pretty good technical reasons as to why. And if you look at the, you know, even the, I'm a little bit involved in, in private uh, investing uh, in, in startups that are kind of in that space. And you'll see a pretty big divide between say multi-coin type of VCs uh, and Bitcoin only VCs. It's, just, it's kind of like a, it's rather, obviously there's areas of overlap, but they're, they're quite separate ecosystems. It's almost like if you look at crypto, Bitcoiners are like the value investors or like the dividend investors of the space. You know, they're, they're kind of, it's like two very different cultures, whereas like the other ones are like the arc type of things. Uh, and so it's kind of gotten a big enough asset area where you have very, very different groups within that asset. And so that this is kind of just something I watch and something I'm, I'm pretty bullish on. But of course, there are risks associated with it. So just about position sizing. Yeah, position sizing is a big one, you know, to investors back in the early days of, you know, crypto, I, I'd always have people, mostly friends, you know, come talk to me and say, what do you think about crypto? You know, should I buy some? Should I not? Should I sell some? Should I sell it? You know, and the framework is always in or out. And I would always tell people, I was like, look, you know, you can diversify this FOMO and regret you're going to have either way. You don't have to go all in or out. Like you don't have to put hundred percent of your net worth in this or nothing. Like you can just put some in. And I said, as part of the global market portfolio at the time, and I think probably now it's still half a percent or something, maybe nobody wants to hear that. Right. I, I, you know, you're on your position size, half a percent, no one, if they got a hundred grand, they want to put in $500, right. They want to put in 80 or nothing. But to me, that's a thoughtful way to do it, because if it does well, it'll grow and be a bigger percent. If it doesn't do well, it'll be smaller. Lynn, as we uh, start to wind down, you know, as, as we're looking at the horizon, it, the year is halfway over, summertime still, but the fall will quickly be upon us. What else are you thinking about? Is anything uh, got you confused, excited, worried? What's on your brain? I'm watching the energy situation in Europe. Uh, just because, you know, going back to the 1940s analogy, I mean, this, this is, I think, a, a pretty transformative decade uh, for how things shake out. And, and there are certain kind of Boolean outcomes, uh, I think, that are, you can really go one way or the other. And so as we go into the fall and winter, I think we have to keep an eye on what's happening with, with Europe's energy situation uh, and their, you know, their internal politics around their energy situation. And so I think that that might be one of the biggest risks to look out for. Or, you know, alternatively, if you have, if you have like a super mild winter and if there's like we're some sort of de-escalation, uh, you know, maybe the the super bearish stuff goes away and and then there's an opportunity there. And so I think that's that's the, kind of the core in the world for like really divergent outcome possibilities compared to a lot of other markets. You know what the energy trying to bring a little light to the situation. But you know what it reminds me of? I was thinking about this morning over coffee with energy, uh, with with Europe and Russia, because they're totally dependent on each other, right? So energy, uh, Europe needs the energy, Russia needs to sell it. So it reminds me of a couple that lives together and then breaks up. But then they, for whatever reason, are, are stuck living together for like another three months or six months. They're like, we've broken up. We're definitely broken up, but we're both don't have any money. So you can't move out for three more months or something, right? So they don't like being together. They come home, they avoid each other, but they have really no alternative. 
you know, and that's how it resolves, you know, I, we'll see. But to me, it feels like that. And then maybe in globalization, it's a good thing, you know, that people are so interconnected, they have to at least try to play nice, but who knows? I think that's a good way to phrase it, because basically long term, Russia wants to reroute its, its you know, its sales towards the east. Uh, and long term, Europe wants to diversify its its energy input. And but both of those things take time and capital and and development. And so it, it's, it is a really challenging thing for both of them in the meantime. And so, like, like I said, that's that's one of the areas that I'm just watching pretty closely in terms of how it can affect global markets and, and some of those markets specifically. This has been a whirlwind. We're definitely going to have to have you back um, to chat uh, as, as the year progresses. People want to follow. We'll add some show note links, but uh, where do they go to find out more about you, your writing, your thoughts, your ideas? Uh, so I'm at lindalden.com. Uh, that's where most of my work is. And then I'm also active on Twitter at Lynn Alden Contact. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you.